Welcome to TSX Quarterly, the podcast that brings you publicly available earnings calls from companies listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange in one convenient location. Gone are the days of looking through confusing websites. You'll find the important information right here. Enjoy the call. Thank you for standing by. This is the conference operator. Welcome to the Great West Life Co. third quarter 2021 results conference call. I would now like to turn the conference over to Mr. Paul Mann, President and CEO of Great West Life Co. Please go ahead. Thank you, Ariel. Good morning and welcome to Great West Life Co.'s third quarter 2021 conference call. We hope that you and your families are safe and healthy. Joining me on today's call is Gary McNicholas, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, and together we'll deliver today's formal presentation. Also joining us on the call and available to answer your questions are David Harney, President and COO Europe, Arshul Jamal, President and Group Head Strategy, Investment, Reinsurance and Corporate Development, Jeff McCowan, President and Chief Operating Officer Canada, Ed Murphy, President and Chief Executive Officer of Empower Retirement, and Bob Reynolds, President and Chief Executive Officer, Putnam Investments. Before we start, I'll draw your attention to our cautionary notes regarding forward-looking information and non-IFRS financial measures, and that's on slide two. These apply to today's discussion and presentation materials. Please turn to slide four. We're very pleased with our third quarter performance, and that's highlighted by solid underlying business results across all businesses and strong continuing momentum. Before we get into uh, a review of the third quarter results, I'd like to take a moment to address our changing world. Um, There's a range of important issues that are reshaping both national and global priorities. That includes the ongoing COVID pandemic and plans towards recovery, stubborn and persistent challenges that we see regarding racial and social injustice, uh, rising inflation and disruptions to the global supply chain, and also the urgent need for collective action on climate. And the reality is these are real issues, and we are engaged in the important discourse that's happening globally to resolve them. We fundamentally believe that to effectively address these issues, it will take collaboration between government, business, communities, and civil society. And I can assure you that Great West Life Co. is deeply committed to being an active participant in defining and implementing solutions driven by our values and our purpose. A great example is our purpose at Canada Life here in Canada which is to improve the financial, physical, and mental well-being of Canadians. This mindset helps shape our role in addressing environmental, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and sustainability challenges in the context of our own ESG programs. And our values inform similar work in the United States and across the European markets. We look forward to sharing more on this in the coming weeks and months. Amid all this challenge and change, Great West Life Co. is well positioned to continue creating value for stakeholders across our businesses. Our performance is supported by our values, our resilient and diversified business model, our disciplined approach to capital deployment, and our deep, risk-sensitive experience and expertise. Looking to our value creation priorities and medium-term financial objectives, we're very pleased with our progress this quarter, including strong financial results. I'll provide some insights into how we're advancing our business strategies when we get to our segment discussions shortly. These include launching solutions that marry our expertise with customers' values and needs, like responsible investing, digital experiences that are personalized, and advice that guides customers as they move towards their financial wellness goals. We've been very active in M&A over the last year, with a focus on three uh, customer-focused priorities, advice, digital delivery, and workplace extensions. Let me pause now on the fourth priority, risk and investment expertise. Last month, we announced a strategic partnership with Cigard Holdings. This follows another transaction we did a year ago with McKenzie to acquire a strategic stake in Northleaf. These actions and other steps we've taken across the portfolio broaden our access to alternative investment capabilities. This is a key area of focus as we work to strengthen products and service for customers and increase returns for shareholders. By focusing on our values and investing in our priorities, we are confident in our ability to achieve our medium-term financial objectives. While Gary will elaborate on the drivers in his prepared remarks, 
The bottom of this slide illustrates our performance this quarter relative to our stated objectives. Please turn to slide five. Our third quarter saw strong, very strong overall results supported by consistent performance across businesses. Results reflected solid operating fundamentals and the benefits of disciplined capital deployment. While our capital and risk solution segment set up provisions for catastrophe losses and experienced U.S. mortality issues related to COVID, expected profit growth was strong. Overall base earnings in the quarter were $870 million and net earnings were $872 million. Base EPS of 93 cents was up 27% year over year. The strong year over year growth in EPS reflects higher market levels, the mass mutual business coming on stream, including synergies, and excellent expected profit growth in all segments. Net earnings of 94 cents per share were up 6% year over year, mainly due to higher base earnings with positive actuarial basis changes and market related impacts offsetting acquisition related costs. You recall that in Q3 2020, there was a gain on the sale of IPSI in Ireland that moderates the year over year growth rate. Turning to Canada results on slide six, we're pleased to see solid momentum in insurance sales and strong wealth sales in quarter for both group and individual customer. We're advancing our Canadian wealth management strategy with the launch of new Canada Life sustainable portfolios in September. The new portfolios provide investors with access to responsible investing strategies that are diversified across both asset classes and regions. And our strategic partnership with Sigard will broaden our access to alternative assets for both wealth management and balance sheet solutions. We're also extending our group offering through the acquisition of Claim Secure, which closed on September 1st. It will enhance Canada Life's workplace benefits capabilities and extend our presence in a growing market for TPA and TPP services. Moving to slide seven, Empower's strong growth trajectory continued this quarter with large plan sales driving a year over year increase combined with strong growth in the government, nonprofit and retail wealth management segments. Notably, Empower IRA assets and personal capital assets were both up over 50% compared to last year. As I noted last quarter, Empower IRA growth has been achieved using our existing model before leveraging personal capital capabilities. We're pleased to have recently launched the first phase of a new personalized digital platform that combines the experience and technology of Empower and personal capital for the first time. This enhanced customer experience will continue to roll out across Empower segments over 2022. And importantly, the mass mutual and personal capital integrations are progressing well. To date, we've achieved US $60 million in annual pre-tax run rate synergies related to mass mutual. We're on track to reach our US $160 million target in 2022. And finally, we continue to track to a Q1 2022 closing for the Prudential transaction. Moving to slide eight, Putnam has continued to deliver strong investment performance for customers with 28 funds rated four or five stars by Morningstar. This performance underpins our ability to sustain and grow our assets under management, which increased by US $18 billion year over year to just under US 200 billion. This growth was supported by strong equity markets and solid asset retention across equity and longer duration fixed income solutions, with net outflows of US 1.6 billion primarily from lower fee fixed income products. Moving to slide nine, sales in Europe continued to rebound from COVID impacts with a 1.3 billion UK annuity deal in quarter. Additionally, we've seen strength in equity released mortgage sales alongside higher wealth sales. Europe also saw overall positive flows in both wealth management and investment only solutions. In Ireland, we closed the Arc Life acquisition on November 1st, bringing 150,000 policies and 2.1 billion euro in assets to Irish life. As a reminder, this is a very straightforward integration as we, already, as we were already administering the business on the Irish Life platform as an outsourced service provider. Moving to slide 10, capital and risk solutions saw strong expected profit growth of 8% year over year. The pipeline for new business remains very strong in both structured life and longevity, and we com competed 
we completed a reinsurance agreement covering a significant block of life policies in Japan. Japan is a new market for us, and this is the second transaction we've done there this year, a testament to our strong reputation and recognized expertise. Although not covered on this slide, there were two reinsurance headwinds in quarter that impacted base earnings. These were PNC cat loss claims related to flooding and elevated U.S. traditional life reinsurance claims related to COVID. While Gary will cover these matters in his comments, we remain comfortable with our overall reinsurance risk profile and confident with our growth prospects. With that, I'll now turn the call over to Gary to review the financial highlights. Gary? Thank you, Paul. Please turn to slide 12. Overall, as Paul noted, we were very pleased with the financial results this quarter. In addition to highlighting the strong momentum we see across the businesses, the results also reflect the strategic deployment of capital in the past year. Compared to the prior year, base EPS of 93 cents was up 27% and closer to 30% in constant currency. The increase was due to a number of factors, broad-based business growth, higher stock market levels, and the significant acquisitions in the last year. Notwithstanding adverse claims experience in the Capital and Risk Solutions Reinsurance Business Unit, the strength in base earnings was evident across the segments. While there were a number of larger items impacting results this quarter, they were generally offsetting, with the strength in base earnings reflecting very solid underlying business fundamentals. Starting with Canada, base earnings were $312 million, up 16% from Q3 last year. Business performance was good, with expected profit up 6% and the insurance experience, life, health and disability, producing a solid gain. Canada also saw a steady contribution from yield enhancement activity in the quarter. In the U.S., base earnings were up significantly from Q3 2020. The acquired mass mutual business continued to perform well, adding 68 million Canadian or 54 million U.S. dollars to base earnings, including some early expense synergy gains and strong fee income. Note this includes financing costs and amortization of intangibles on the mass mutual business. On a run rate basis, 60 million US of the targeted 160 million pre-tax expense synergies have been achieved thus far. Customer retention to date has also been excellent and integration activity is on track. Personal capital continues to invest in new customer acquisition to fuel growth and profitability and it narrowed the base loss this quarter to four million US dollars as the enforced book of business continues to grow and generate profits. The rollout of personal capital digital capabilities to the broader Empower client base is successfully underway with an initial pilot group with further rollout scheduled for later this year and into Q1. Looking at Empower excluding mass mutual and personal capital, base earnings were up sharply year over year as a result of strong organic growth, higher markets, and the continued growth trajectory of the Empower IRA rollover business, with assets under administration growing 54% year over year in that book. Empower also benefited from investment gains in the surplus account this quarter and a one-time tax gain of 6 million Canadian. Putnam's results also improved year over year. Fee revenues were up due to the growth in AUM and also the growth in equity mandates relative to short duration fixed income, an improving mix from a revenue perspective. While seed capital results were largely break even in period, compared to strong gain in Q3 2020, Putnam did benefit this quarter from a one time tax gain of 14 million Canadian. In Europe, base earnings increased 27%, helped by a one time pension expense gain in Ireland, although somewhat offset by. Uh, FX uh, rates on the euro. Good underlying performances in the UK, Ireland and Germany were driven by the continued recovery in sales, favorable insurance experience and increased fee revenue from net flows and market growth. The UK landed a $1.3 billion bulk annuity sale this quarter. New business gains have not been recognized to date as the backing assets are still being finalized. Capital Risk Solutions had a more mixed quarter. The business itself continues to grow nicely, including the expansion into newer markets with strong new business gains in quarter. However, in period, 
there were significant adverse claims experience in the PNC catastrophe line and in the U.S. life reinsurance line. The PNC experience impacted earnings by 61 million, resulting from provisions for potential losses on Hurricane Ida and the extraordinarily severe German flooding. The higher U.S. life claims impacted earnings by 71 million, which includes a provision for additional excess claims in the near term. These are primarily COVID-related claims as the current wave has resulted in elevated infections and mortality rates in the U.S. However, compared to the U.S., mortality rates have been less impacted recently in the U.K. and Netherlands, and as a result, we did not see the offsets in the longevity business this quarter. Coming back up to the LifeCo level and looking at net earnings, the overall impact of excluded items is immaterial at $2 million, and net EPS of $0.94 cents mirrors the strength in base EPS. Net earnings were up 6% from Q3 2020, which included a $94 million gain on the sale of Iris Progressive Services Unit, IPSI. Turning to slide 13, here we can see the impact of the various excluded items, which netted to $2 million overall. Actuarial basis changes in management actions were a positive $69 million, and that in incorporates or includes a negative impact of $33 million from the actuarial standards change effective this quarter. In addition, greater clarity on property valuations in the UK led to the recognition of market value gains on UK property holdings, particularly the industrial sector, and this is reflected in the actuarial liabilities. The remaining excluded items this quarter were primarily transaction and integration costs related to last year's U.S. acquisitions, as well as a legacy cleanup item in the corporate segment. I would highlight the personal capital transaction costs. Recall an element of the purchase price was a contingent consideration, payable in December this year and next, provided certain targets are achieved. Based on the strong performance of personal capital to date, we have increased the provision for this contingent consideration. Turn to slides 14 and 15. These next two slides highlight the source of earnings, first from a base earnings perspective and then a net earnings one. I'll focus my comments on slide 15, the net earnings perspective source of earnings, with a reminder that the amounts above the line are pre-tax. Expected profit was up 23% year over year, notwithstanding some currency pressure from US dollars and euros. Mass mutual and personal capital were not in Q3 2020, but added 84 million this quarter. Even without that boost, we are seeing a 47% increase in the US and a 12% expected profit increase overall, generally coming from organic business growth and fee income benefits from higher market levels. Canada, Europe, and capital risk solutions were all up between six and 8% year over year. Moving to new business, Capital and Risk Solutions recorded an outsized new business gain this quarter, primarily on larger asset-based transactions, which, similar to bulk annuities, recognize a portion of the investment gains up front. As we develop good visibility on the assets to back the portfolio, we realized gains this quarter, including some catch-up on transactions written earlier this year. Notwithstanding the adverse claims experience in reinsurance, Overall experience gains contributed positively in the quarter, and I'll cover these and actuarial basis changes on the next slide. Note that the UK property-related gains reflected in liabilities are excluded from base earnings, which accounts for the difference in experience gains between the base and net source of earnings displays. Earnings on surplus of minus 18 million is down from 8 million last year, primarily due to lower seed capital results at Putnam, an increased financing costs, and a reclassification in Canada. The effective tax rate on base shareholder earnings was 9.5% and on net earnings was 8%, primarily reflecting the jurisdictional mix of earnings and also a $26 million benefit from the release of certain tax provisions, including $20 million between Putnam and Empower and $6 million in corporate. Before the release of those provisions, the effective tax rate on base earnings was 12%. Turn to slide 16. These tables expand on the experience results as well as the management actions and changes in assumptions 
to highlight various items in the quarter, some of which we have touched on already. As shown in the chart on the left, yield enhancement continued to contribute positively, particularly in Canada and the UK this quarter. We continue to originate a steady volume of equity lease mortgages in the UK on an improving residential property backdrop. The net impact of mortality, longevity, and morbidity was modestly negative this period due to the combination of the COVID-related claims in US life reinsurance noted earlier and generally positive experience in the other areas, again reflecting the benefits of our diversified book of business. Credit-related impacts were positive this quarter as our high-quality investment portfolio continues to perform well with minor ratings changes and a recovery in previously impaired assets leading to an experienced gain. The chart on the right details the major basis changes with a positive impact from changes in the economic assumptions used in liability modeling, being partly offset by the actuarial standards change and an update to policyholder behavior assumptions in Canada. Moving to slide 17, this slide highlights operating expenses by segment. Expenses are up year over year, as expected given the increase in business, both organically and through M&A. While there are a number of adjustments to consider, overall, expense growth is well below the growth in expected profit as the company continues to apply disciplined expense management and benefits from leverage in market-related fee income. Please turn to slide 18. The Q3 book value per share of $24.40 was up 8% year over year, driven almost entirely by increased retained earnings, given the solid results in each of the past four quarters. Currency movements in OCI have been a headwind with a strengthening Canadian dollar, but this has been largely offset by a pickup in pension OCI given the increase in interest rates this year. The LICAT ratio at Canada Life remains strong, although lower by three points compared to last quarter, primarily due to increased new business requirements on the large asset-based transactions noted earlier. In addition, as noted in recent quarters, this also includes the continued phase-in of the new most adverse LICAT scenario, which impacted the ratio by one point. LifeCo Cash ended the quarter at uh, 0.6 billion, which is down from 0.9 billion at Q2, as a result of repaying the $500 million short-term debt component of the Mass Mutual Financing Plan, and that was within nine months of the close date, slightly ahead of schedule given the strong results to date. And just a reminder, the LifeCo cash balance is not included in the LICAT ratio. Back to you, Paul. Thank you, Gary. Uh, please turn to slide 19. Um, as outlined in my opening remarks, amidst the many challenges that are shaping aspects of our world, we believe Great West LifeCo is well positioned to adapt, respond, and create value for stakeholders. We delivered a strong quarter with continuing momentum supported by solid operating fundamentals and the benefits of disciplined capital deployment. Looking ahead, we're confident in delivering on the financial expectations we've set for ourselves. And we'll do this by focusing on and investing in our four priorities to drive value creation while being an active participant in defining and implementing a sustainable path forward for all stakeholders in the markets where we operate. And with that, that concludes my formal remarks. Uh, and Ariel, please open the line for questions. Thank you. We will now begin the question and answer session. To join the question queue, you may press star, then 1 on your telephone keypad. You will hear a tone acknowledging your request. If you are using a speakerphone, please pick up your handset before pressing any keys. To withdraw your question, please press star, then 2. We will pause for a moment as callers join the queue. Our first question comes from Minnie Grauman of Scotiabank. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. I uh, just wanted to uh, talk about uh, uh, excess capital and potential capital deployment, Paul. Uh, just if you could update your thoughts on the dividend and then also uh, if you have uh, uh, what you see as a capacity in terms of excess capital potentially for buybacks and your view on buybacks at this stage, uh, given Prudential and everything that you've done so far. Okay. Um that's that's a, a fulsome question. So I'll, I'll start off with the first uh, question about our views on on excess capital. And you know, actually, I'll, I'll sort of start off at the top and say that we have deployed significant amount of capital over the last 18 months, and I think we've uh, deployed it quite effectively. You can see that in our strong results. And I, I would say that if you think about you know in the U.S. with Empower, 
uh, we've got our plate pretty full with the integrations over the coming quarters, so we'll be remain very laser focused on that. Having said that, um, we are not uh, shy to continue looking at opportunities to strengthen the portfolio. So, you know, the reality is for the right opportunities, we're going to find ways to finance those. So that's, that's our mindset as we think about growth going forward. Um, at this stage, as I think about dividends, uh, clearly we're, we have to wait and see what happens with the communication that's going to uh, presumably uh, flow this afternoon um, with the um, com communication from OSFI. But with that in mind, um, we've always had a progressive dividend policy, and we would anticipate moving back to that. But I think we have to actually, you know, wait and see what the, um, what the lay of the land is uh, as we hear from OSFI. And um, our intent would be, as I said, to get back into um, a progressive dividend policy. And at this stage, we're very focused on thinking about how to create value uh, through M&A and through extending our businesses. And that would always be a priority from our perspective versus buybacks. Got it. And you have an active um, uh, NCIB. Should we read anything into that? Uh, I guess based on your comments, not so much, but I'm just wondering about that. Yeah. No, no, I don't think you should read anything into that. Anything you would add, Gary? Uh, no, uh, that's uh, in place. Uh, largely, uh, you know, at a minimum, we would look to be... Uh, removing the dilution from uh, from granted uh, share options and we've typically used it for that purpose and then obviously it gives us flexibility in other in other circumstances that arise but certainly wouldn't read anything into us just keeping that open sounds good thank you very much hate crimes are dangerous and insidious but you have the power to help stop them if you witness or experience a hate crime a criminal offense motivated by race religion disability, sexual orientation, or other characteristics, you can report it to the FBI, who is committed to protecting communities and supporting victims. Submit a tip at 800-CALL-FBI or tips.fbi.gov. The FBI is here to help. Protecting our communities together. Report hate crimes. With MailChimp, you get more than a URL. You get an all-in-one marketing platform to help drive sales. With things like data-driven recommendations and powerful automation tools. Get started today at MailChimp.com slash smart marketing. MailChimp, built for growing businesses. Our next question comes from Gabrielle Deshane of National Bank Financial. Please go ahead. Hey, good uh, morning. Um Got the cutoff here before noon, so I can still say that. Uh, first question is on your yield enhancement gains. Uh, year to date, just under $200 million pre-tax. Very simple question. Does that number look the same under IFRS 17, or is it lower? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm still not quite sure. I've, I've gone back and forth with a few companies. It sounds to me like it might be lower because it's no longer up front, recognized up front and it's amortized, but... Uh, uh, curious to hear what you have to say. Okay, I'm going to turn that. Th thank you very much for the question, Gabrielle, and I'll turn that one right over to Gary. Sure. Um, yeah, I would expect all else being equal, Gabriel, it will be uh, somewhat lower. It uh, it doesn't disappear, but it will be somewhat lower, and that that will ultimately depend, uh, you know, in our situation on the various accounting policies and all the different blocks of business. But so there will be uh, it'd be a little lower in the short term. Obviously, uh, you get the benefit, the economic benefit from the yield enhancement will show up. Um, some of the cases it will be uh, it will be feathered into earnings or amortized into earnings over time, but uh, some will continue to end up uh, being upfront through the discount rate mechanism in IFRS 17. So a bit of a mix. Yeah. Go ahead, Gabriel. You go ahead. Oh, I, I'm just trying to uh, uh, get a sense here. Is it is that number affected like on a pro forma on an IFRS 9 basis, uh, 17 sorry basis? Uh, based on the duration of the asset. So you take cash, you put it into a riskier asset. If it's a five-year uh, asset or a 10-year asset, you divide, instead of present valuing it in, in year one, you would spread that gain over a five- or 10-year period. That type of concept, is that how it works? I think, uh, I think Eric, this, this might be one to be worth following. We do plan to have, uh, as obviously, yeah. as IRS 17 approaches, a lot more discussion about how the, uh, the various mechanisms will work. So it's just the high-level answer is that there'll be some adjustment to the yield enhancement, but I, there's a lot of moving parts with the uh, with the CSM and all that to be considered. So I, I wouldn't want to draw a conclusion just looking at one component. I think that's right. probably the, the transition over. 
Okay, and Paul, you were, I cut you off. I, no, no I, I just wanted to say, you know, underlying this, as Gary said, um, the economics of the business will right. remain very active. We're, we're, you know, we like the way we're strengthening uh, the business through yield enhancement, through considering alternative assets, through leveraging things like our equity release mortgages. And we see all of, all, all of that ultimately driving uh, value creation. Um, there's going to be obviously some timing differences there, but we don't see it as being a significant impact. But I do think the key is to, unlock, uh, to, to unpack that a bit through some education sessions. Right. Uh, and, and well, another uh, thing that might arrive in 2023 is the global minimum tax. I, I asked about it last quarter. I got to ask if you have any additional thoughts on, on the impact. I see, you know, year to date and again this quarter, sub 10% tax rate. Uh, I looked over the past five years, 13 out of 20 quarters where your tax rate's below 15%. Uh, is this something that's becoming uh, a, maybe a more pressing issue as far as how you uh, you are uh, structuring your business? Uh, I guess I'd start off by saying that we don't have full clarity um, and insight into what the global minimum tax will look like. And so I think it's too early in the process to you know, start drawing uh, direct conclusions. I would say, though, that if you were to look at our normalized tax rate this quarter, and I think Gary uh, quoted that, that it was in the low teens. Um, and that's a function of our mix of business. And obviously, in any quarter, we're going to have various provisions that occur that would move that up and down. As we think about the business going forward, though, the reality is we're seeing high growth um, in our business in some higher tax jurisdictions, like an Empower business, for example. So as we think about the you know, overall impact of this, uh, you know, it's not something that's really concerning us. And more importantly, um, as we look out ahead, we don't see it having a, an impact on the, the guidance we provided re regarding our, um, our EPS growth expectations. So we kind of look at it in, from that context and recognizing the growth we're, we're going to see in the U.S. in particular. Okay, so you don't see that affecting the 8 to 10% target? No, no, no. we don't. Thank you for that. Our next question comes from Doug Young of Desjardins Capital. Please go ahead. I'll be the first to say good afternoon then. Um, so we mentioned that the CRS division, or was mentioned the CRS division had adverse mortality claims experienced in the quarter. It was 71 million. I assume that's after tax. And I'm hoping maybe, Arshal, you can flush that out a little bit. I know you've talked a little bit about flexing that business in times when, you know, pricing is attractive and contracting it when it's not. Just want to get a sense of, first off, what are you seeing so far in Q4? Should we expect that to kind of continue to linger, the COVID death claims? And how are you thinking about this business? And then I just have a follow-up on that. Okay. Um, so, uh, it's Paul. I'm going to start off just talking at a high level about CRS where as we look at that business, we like its diversification across a range of different risk classes. And I think it fits really well within our portfolio. It, you know, there's significant expertise we draw on, the same expertise that our, all of our customer base draws on. Uh, so you know, we recognize that there can be some volatility in things like PNC cat, cat claims, um, but those will occur over longer cycles and, and we do view that business as ultimately profitable. And um, the other thing we like about that aspect of it is the risks are actually uncorrelated with life, uh, you know, broader life co risks. So overall, we're comfortable with the risk profile, and we're actually comfortable with viewing it as a continuing, um, you know, element of uh, a growth strategy across life co. But I'll let I'll let Arshul comment on the specifics of uh, thinking about it, looking at it going forward. Arshul. So, so before digging into the numbers in quarter, I just wanted to give you a little bit of perspective, sort of looking both through 2020 and across 2021. So within the CRS seg segment, we have both longevity exposures, primarily in the UK and in the Netherlands, and then the mortality exposure, which is largely in the US. And cumulatively over the two years, the favorable impact of excess deaths on the longevity book continues to be a little bit higher than the cumulative impact on the mortality book, but we did not see that offset this quarter as we noted. Um, so we were very comfortable with the overall portfolio and the diversification between longevity and mortality. In quarter, you noted the 71 million after tax of variance Canadian dollars, um, and that was $90, $90 million pre-tax. So 90 million pre-tax, 71 million after tax, and within that provision is an allowance about just over a third of that 
for continuing excess claims into Q4. Um, but I'm not going to comment on our uh, position in, in, in internal reporting through October or into November. Uh, we're engaged with our clients. Uh, we're monitoring all of the population level data in all of the jurisdictions that we're operating, um, and we're taking pricing action uh, where it makes sense for us or whatever, and being very cautious in underwriting new traditional mortality business um, in the U.S. In, the, in this environment. So that's really the context that I would provide, but 71 million after taxes, 90 million uh, pre-tax in the quarter. And it takes me to my follow-up. Gary, on page or slide 16, you have mortality, longevity, morbidity, um, uh, experience. It was negative 22 million post-tax. This is obviously 71 million. So there's obviously some big positives that, that's on the other side of this negative. Can you maybe unpack that negative 22 million? So, you know, this was a big negative of 71. What were the big positive items? Yeah, uh, Gary, why don't you take that? Uh, sure. I, I think the... Um just on, on the positives, uh, I, I think I mentioned earlier, Canada had a, a, a game when you look across the life uh, disability and, uh, and health claims in Canada, the health and dental, and then again you see it in uh, uh, some positives in uh, the other jurisdictions in, uh, in Europe. So uh, most of that, uh, the positives were, were pretty, uh, pretty much split between the two. I think there'd be more positives in Canada. And again, that's uh, partly a good experience on the, uh, on the disability book. Uh, some some actual positive experience on the on the life book uh, and the annuity book, you know, again small positives, but they all went uh, positive. And then uh, again, we're still seeing some underutilization on the uh, some of the health, like the uh, the dental or the chiropractor and those type of claims in Canada. Similarly, we're seeing some underutilization on the health uh, uh, claims in, in Ireland uh, this period. Uh, so, yeah, it was uh, pretty much spread across the group in the other areas was positive. Yeah, and Gary, I, I would just add that it speaks to the diversification of the business. Uh, so we're diversified by country, we're diversified by across mortality and morbidity. And um, the other thing I would note, and Gary made reference to that, or Arshel made reference to the fact that we're actively managing this from the standpoint of pricing and underwriting and risk selection. You know, we, we take a very, um, I would say, disciplined approach when it comes to underwriting and selection of risk, uh, managing pricing, looking at these. You've seen us work our way out of, you know, past uh, disability, group disability issues in Canada. We're active on this in the, exactly the same way, and we'll continue to have those disciplines. Okay, and then just a quick numbers question. Gary, did I, did I hear you say you had a tax benefit at putt number 14 million, a 6 million one at Empower, and then 26 million at corporate for a total of 46 million is that is, did I get all those numbers right uh, Gary why don't you uh, just, that? just to clarify it was six million at corporate and then the uh, the 14 and the six that you've noted at uh, Putnam and, and power respectively so 26 million was the total oh it's the total okay and then um, if you which is about two and a half percent on the effective tax rate for base earnings so that's how it takes you from the nine and a half up to a 12 percent effective tax rate Got it, got it. And then lastly, just to clarify, on the LICAP being down sequentially, I was actually surprised, but did you move cash out of the OPCO up to the HOLDCO, or was this purely just a function of business growth? And what were, was that business growth? Was that related to the annuity um, business you wrote in, in Europe? Yeah, Gary? Uh, sure. There was, uh, you know, in terms of the dividends up, um, that – I think the dividends were a little bit higher in Q3. I mean, obviously the earnings were also quite strong in Q3. So, but the dividends were a bit higher. Uh, but that, uh, so that might have accounted for a small, uh, small portion of it. But really, was those large, uh, both the um, the asset-based transactions in the reinsurance segments that drove the new business gains, plus also the uh, bulk annuity in the UK. Uh, those large uh, asset-based transactions added to the new business requirements. Uh, but again, they're a profitable transaction, so we're quite happy to take the like out and earn a good return on that. I'm sorry, I'm going to throw one quick one in here. You've got, you said that you did that $1.3 billion bulk annuity, but you didn't finalize the assets. So, so we should assume there's going to be a gain coming through when you finalize the assets? Is that, is that, uh, as, that yeah, so I'll start off at a high level. Obviously, as we, as we you know, lock in these sales, uh, we're always looking for yield enhancement and improvement in the overall, you know, ALM matching and opportunities to enhance yield. We're not going to project on that, but that is a discipline we have across our businesses and we'll continue to, we'll continue, 
continue to have that discipline moving forward. Thank you. Our next question comes from Tom McKinnon of BMO Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks very much. Good afternoon. Um, just continuing on that 1.3 billion bulk annuity deal, um, I, I understand your hesitancy to talk about potential yield enhancements, but my understanding is there's generally a new business gain associated with this. So how should we be looking at uh, the new business gain associated with that for the fourth quarter? And a follow up. Yeah. Okay, uh, Gary, I'll let you take that one. Uh, sure. So I, I think the way I'd uh, describe it is there's, uh, you know, provided we secure the, the right assets, there is an opportunity for a new business gain in the fourth quarter, but we have to just finalize those assets. Um, often it, on the smaller deals, we've often got the assets lined up, and so you'll see um, a gain in the same period. And in this case, given the size of the, the transaction, we wanted better visibility on, uh, on those assets before declaring uh, any any gains that might come. So I describe it as an opportunity in Q4 for us. Okay. Um, now, the question with respect to capital and risk solutions and and uh, I, the 85 million uh, impact in new business, the, I'm not really sure how we can really kind of model this because it's been like, it was largely negative in 2020 and hasn't done anything so far in 2021. So was this related to this uh, Japan reinsurance deal, uh, and uh, how should we be thinking about uh, these uh, the, the impact of new business with respect to capital risk solutions going forward? Like, uh, um, obviously, we're not expecting 85 million one-time uh, increase in that every quarter, but uh, we're going to need some help here in trying to figure out a, why that happens and how frequently it will happen. Uh, just given the fact that like, historically we haven't seen anything like that in capital yeah. before. Yes, so Tom, I'll start off and then I'll pass it to Arshul. Um, to start with, um, we have a very disciplined approach to, you know, selecting transactions that we, that we fundamentally believe will drive value creation. Now, the reality is the profit signature of transactions can be quite different. So, you know, it's not like there's a single way of looking at all of these. This particular, particular transaction had a profit signature and was of a scale where it had that level of impact. So the reality is, you know, we can prov provide you with some insights into this particular transaction, uh, but the reality is some transactions will have a bit of strain uh, up front and then we'll have stronger releases in subsequent periods. And, and so, so I'll let Arshul give you a bit of context for that. Arshul? So, Paul, you're absolutely right. In, in the, na the nature of the businesses that we have in CRS or whatever spans some businesses, like the business that I'm just going to talk about that generates potentially upfront gains when we write new business, and then we have other businesses from time to time that generate upfront losses, and we really look at sort of the economic position and our return on capital over the life of the product. So you will see sort of fluctuations in the impact of new business, positive and negative, which is why we anchor most of our disclosure around expected profit growth. And I think that's the forward-looking measure that I encourage you to look, look upon the most. Um, turning to these deals, um, I think we've highlighted uh, through the discussions and in the MDNA that we've taken on two blocks of Japanese liabilities with upfront premiums. Um, and cumulatively, we have just over $4 billion Canadian dollars of Japanese government yen that we've uh, brought into the investment portfolio. And we've been working really, really hard on the investment side to get into the flow so that we can get corporate bonds in yen denominated, both multinationals that issue in yen and domestic Japanese companies. And then alongside that, we've also been ramping up our efforts to uh, buy sterling and U.S. dollar assets, corporate bonds, and swap them into yen with the appropriate collateral and cross-currency swap arrangements. And then finally, we're thinking about introducing, in a very modest way, some illiquid assets into that portfolio. And it's really getting all of those things up and running that's allowed us to have the confidence to book the new business gain on that whole set of transactions this quarter. So that's really the color around that. And if we get opportunities in the future to bring on lots of Japanese government bonds or other um, you know, gov government securities and then deploy them using our investment management capabilities or whatever, then we will see other opportunities to add new business profits and or yield enhancement gains. But that's really what happened um, in, in, in this period around that uh, the, those liabilities in Japan. 
And how much of it was a catch up from prior quarters and how much of the 85 actually happened in the quarter? It, 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 it's almost impossible now to untangle because we're managing the two transactions together and looking at our total pool of yen liabilities or whatever. So I wouldn't want to get into that or whatever. But you know, the transaction that we did this quarter was about twice the size of the transaction that we did earlier. But then again, we've been sort of chewing up our building our capabilities and then chewing up all of the assumptions or whatever. But rough orders of magnitude, sort of two thirds this quarter, one third from earlier in the year. Okay, oh, and and and. Isn't this more of an investment gain? It, 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 why is it classified as a new business gain? Well, shouldn't we be thinking of it more as an investment gain, at least on what you're trying to do with all you know, uh, swapping currencies and whatnot? Uh, it seems to me like it's more of an investment gain. Is it, am I correct there, or how should I think of that? You, you, you're absolutely right. It is an investment gain, but then we get into a classification issue when we get investment gains on new business within 12 months of writing that contract and certainly within the same calendar year. So it's been our practice to try to reflect some of that as new business gains, and you would have seen that on the annuity, on the bulk annuity side as well. So as Gary indicated on some of the smaller bulk annuity transactions where we already have the assets in place, we'll often report a new business gain, but that's really driven by our investment performance and the difference between the discount rate on the liability side and the assumed rate on the asset portfolio. Um, so it, it, it's really hard to split to whatever new business gains and yield enhancement gains, but certainly within the first year, our bias is to reflect and call it new business gain. Okay, thanks very much for that. Our next question comes from Paul Holden of CIBC. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, first question is related to ACMA and specifically the economic assumption updates. Just wondering if you can give us some color if that's related to a shift in asset allocation or if it's just simply a change in uh, return assumption. Uh, Gary, do you want to take that? Sure. Uh, this is the um, the uh, economic assumptions one. So as we were, um, as part of our work on implementing the new actuarial standards, which included a review of the ultimate reinvestment rates, we also did a review of our overall provisions for reinvestment risk under various scenarios. And then we concluded from that review that our existing provisions were more prudent than required given the continued low interest rate environment. So it's an area of ex excess strength on the balance sheet and that's what led to the release this quarter. So it's really just a broader um, review of reinvestment uh, risk and provisions within our within our balance sheet, rather than a specific assumption. I see. So that's more likely to be a one-time type gain than something you can continue to drive going forward. Yeah, it would generally be that, and then there, um, yeah, that that would, that's a good way to characterize it. Okay. Okay. Uh, second question is with respect to LICAT and this interest rate scenario, which has been, been a negative drag on LICAT for a number of quarters now. Is there a way you can level set us to help determine where we might get a interest rate scenario switch back to a less adverse uh, scenario? And just obviously asking because bond yields are starting to push higher prospect of central bank tightening, so um, any kind of um, any kind of sense you can give us might be helpful. Uh, for, for sure. Uh, Gary, why don't you get to that one? Yeah, sure. So um, just to, again, just to level set, we've had this, uh, this grading in of about a point uh, a quarter for the last five quarters, and all else being equal, you'd see, uh, you'd see that again in the, in the fourth quarter. Uh, that said, uh, you're right, with the rising rates, uh, that's something that tends to be beneficial that the rates would have to go up uh, still a fair bit. I don't have an exact number, but they, there's a fair bit of uh, scope there. But also, as uh, another, another way you could see this change is if uh, you were lengthening your portfolio and in improving uh, uh, some of the matching on, uh, on some of that business. So as companies move towards uh, IFRS 17, you might see companies you know, looking at the duration of their portfolio, give them a new IFRS 17, and and that uh, you know, could lead again to, to switching the scenario. So there's um, rising rates and, uh, and your ALM strategies are probably the two, uh, two biggest drivers I'd point to. Okay. Are you then suggesting as part of that answer that with the transition to IFRS 17, Great West will be looking to extend the duration of its fixed income portfolio? Um, so 
I'll start off at a high level and say that as we look to IFRS 17, we're, we're looking broadly across all of our asset and liability pools and thinking about optimizing the business moving forward. And so there'll be obviously a series of actions we'll take in preparation for that and as we transition. Um, no specific guidance, though, on you know, lengthening any particular portfolio backing liabilities, but that's obviously one of the tools that we'll be considering as we, as we transition. Got it, got it. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Once again, if you have a question, please press star, then 1. Our next question comes from Nigel D'Souza of Veritas Investment Research. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I had a first quick question on uh, your capital levels here and for your light cat ratio. Could you share with us what your internal target range is? And the reason I ask that is uh, just to get a sense of what your excess capital is above uh, what your internal target is so we can get a sense of what's actually available for deployment. Yeah, our, uh, thanks, Nigel. Our current internal target range is from 110 to 120% light cat, and we're currently operating above that level. As Gary noted, we've been carving in this uh, uh, this LICAT scenario switch, and uh, we'll have a sixth quarter, so there's sort of a six-point drag that's happened there. But we've also been deploying a lot of capital both to drive you know, ongoing future value creation, and that's our M&A transactions in the U.S. and other transactions like you know, the ARC life and claim secure transactions. So we've been very active in deploying capital. Um, and, and then, you know, the other reality is we've been writing business. So we've been growing organically and driving, you know, growth, things like this, these Japanese transactions and the bulk annuity transactions. So the backdrop to um, the LICAT ratio having coming down is positive in my mind. We've been deploying capital to drive shareholder value creation. I'll let Gary provide any other color you'd like to. Gary? I think you, you pretty much uh, hit it on the head there, Paula. The, the target range of 110 to 120, and we like to operate towards the upper end of that target. And yeah, and, and you know the reality is, as the um, as the scenario uh, switch uh, you know finishes out um, as we as we transition into 2022, the natural growth in the business is going to drive a natural growth in our like at ratio. And um, as you know, we've provided some insight in, uh, around our growth expectations. So I think uh, it, it sort of lends itself to us anticipating that growth in our like at ratio moving forward. Great, that makes sense. And if I could switch to uh, the dividend, when I, when I, uh, from what I understand, you don't uh, have explicitly stated a, a payout ratio that you're targeting for the dividend. But when I look at your historical payout ratio, uh, it has been as high as 70%, albeit that was doing some repositioning on your US business currently at 50%, which is at the high end. So how should we think about the dividend going forward? Is that something that you would consider increasing and then earnings growing to it? Or is that a uh, payout ratio you want to see kind of move lower to a lower uh, uh, number before you kind of right-size that again? Um, thanks for that question. So, so at a high level, we consider a range of factors as we can look at our dividend. We're looking at the you know, expected growth in EPS and growth in the business. We're looking at reinvestment opportunities in the business and the opportunity to grow both organically and inorganically. And fundamentally, uh, taking all those things into account, we've generally had what I'd call a progressive dividend um, approach to dividends as we, we've increased the dividends as the business is growing and as we're growing our earnings. And that would be the mindset we would take uh, as we move forward. At this stage, we're not in the market um, you know, with a published range. Uh, so th that, that's the mindset you, know, you should consider as we think about dividends going forward. I appreciate that. Thank you. This concludes the question and answer session. I would like to turn the conference back over to Mr. Mann for any closing remarks. Uh, thank you, Ariel. And thank you to all who participated in the call for, your, for listening in and participating. Uh, please feel free to connect with our IR team on any follow-up questions. And I would say that we look forward to reconnecting in February 22 for our Q4 call, and I wish you all a safe, healthy, and happy holiday season. Take care. This concludes today's conference call. You may disconnect your lines. Thank you for participating, and have a pleasant day. Annie had an earache on a Saturday of all days. So her mom brought her to Minute Clinic at CVS, where you can see a provider, fill a prescription, and grab essentials like pain relief products, all in one visit. Even on evenings and weekends, you can even see us online with telehealth options. 
for quality, affordable care on your schedule. Visit MinuteClinic at CVS. That's healthier made easier. Services vary by location. See MinuteClinic.com for details. Hi, I'm Pete. I'm an IT manager slash superhero. Pete, bad news. Uh, what happened? I put a very expensive latte on top of my car, drove off, and it spilled. It's bad. How's that my problem? Oh, my laptop was up there, too. <laughs> uh, okay, that's why we use connection services to manage our cloud. Everything's backed up. I can access your stuff remotely. You won't miss a meeting. I really wanted that latte, Pete. For hardware, software, support, and empathy. For Pete's sake, connect with Connection. Thank you for listening to TSX Quarterly. If you enjoyed the cast, remember to leave a good rating. And remember, for any additional inquiries, please consult the company's investor relations section on their website. See you next time.